Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and hi everyone In the second lecture, we are going to continue with chapter 4 of Pure Bending So in previous lecture, we have end up with understanding on some of the requirements that may be applied to the sum of the components and moments of a member that is under pure bending where we know that uh, we should have an internal forces which is equivalent to an axial force and also a couple so we have so in this video we are going to start with the deformation that is caused by a bending we are going to analyze the deformation of a prismatic member uh, possessing a plane of symmetry so let's say we have this uh, prismatic member and the plane is located at it ends uh, subjected to equal and opposite couples m and m prime uh, which act in the plane of the symmetry the member are going to bend under the action of the couples obviously but it will remain symmetric with respect to the plane moreover since the bending moment m is the same in any cross section the member are going to bend uniformly and the line ab along the upper face of the member intersecting of the plane of the couples are going to have a constant curvature so we are going to have a uniform curvature at this surface in other words we can also say that the line from point A to point B line AB are going to decrease okay while the line or the length from A prime to B prime are going to increase. Uh, note that uh, the value of M are going to be assumed as uh, larger than zero. Now, uh, suppose that we have a member like in this figure uh, is divided into large number of small cubic elements where the faces uh, are parallel to each other respectively uh, to the three coordinate planes x y and z now the property we have established requires that these elements to be transformed as shown in this figure okay it is bending upward when the member is subjected to couple m and also couple m prime since all the faces represented in the two projections are at 90 degrees to each other, we can conclude that uh, the shear strain, which is uh, gamma xy, is equal to gamma zx and equal to zero. So there is no shear strain, and therefore, the shear stress tau xy are going to be equal to tau xz or zx are going to be equal to zero and we also have three other stress components which is uh, sigma y sigma z and tau yz and we note that these three stress components must be zero on the surface of the member so at the surface of the member either at the top or at the, at the lower at the bottom surface it must be equal to zero we can assume that these three stress components are equal to zero throughout the members. We can conclude that the only stress components that is being exerted on the small cubic elements that have a certain value is only the normal components sigma x. 
So basically, we are going to have a state of uniaxial stress, okay, where we only have sigma x, okay, the stress at x exists. And we are going to recall that uh, the moment m is larger than 0, and where we observe lines a, b, and a prime, b prime, uh, we can say that line a, b are going to decrease while li lines a, a prime, b prime are going to increase in length. And we also note that uh, the strain epsilon x and the stress sigma x are negative in the upper portion while uh, at the lower portion it is positive. And we can say that uh, at the upper portion it is uh, under compression while at the lower portion it is under tension. Looking at the same diagram, okay, we can say that there must be a surface that is uh, parallel to the upper surface and the lower surface where uh, the epsilon x, okay, the strain, and the stress sigma x are equal to zero. Okay, somewhere in between the upper and the lower surface. And these surfaces are going to be uh, called as the neutral axis. And the, the characteristic is that the strain, the stress is equal to zero. So therefore the length will not change it will remain the same. Now, let's take a look at a strain that is caused by bending. The neutral surface intersects the plane of symmetry along the arc of circle DE. So looking at this figure, we can see the neutral surface is here. And it intersects a transverse section along a straight line called the neutral axis of the section. So we also have a neutral axis of the cross section. Basically, the neutral surface intersects the same neutral axis. So we are going to use the origin of coordinates using the neutral surface. Okay, rather than taking the coordinate from uh, the lower surface of uh, of the members okay we are not going to do this we are going to take our coordinate our origin of coordinate where x y and z equal to zero at the neutral axis okay we are going to take this is because we want to uh, measure the distance from any point from the neutral axis and we are going to measure it by the coordinate y. So let's take a look back at this figure. We can denote that uh, the radius of uh, the arc DE is equal to rho. Okay, it's equal to rho. This is going to be the radius. And uh, the angle corresponding to DE is going to be theta. And by observing the length of DE, okay, we can say that the length L is uh, the length of the undeformed member, no deformations. Therefore, we can say that L is equal to rho theta. So, how did we get these equations? Okay, easily we can just take a review back on our knowledge on circle. Okay, we know that we have, let's say we have a circle. And, the, and we know the equation for this a circle circumference are going to be, let's say the circumference is s is equal to 2 pi r okay for this whole circle 
and we know that from this equation that 2 pi is the angle in radian while r is the radius of the circle okay so this is also equal to 360 degrees so let's say we have an angle of theta okay and we want to know the length l so the equation should be the length l is equal to r or r theta okay in radian now let's go back to our equation here so now we are going to consider uh, the arc jk which is located uh, at somewhere at a distance y from the neutral axis or the neutral surface so at a distance y and we want to know the length of this arc jk so using the same formula okay we can name this length as l prime because this is uh, the length jk is deformed from its original length is equal to rho minus y theta so since the original length of arc jk was equal to l so we can say that the, the deformation uh, of uh, arc jk delta should be equal to l prime minus l and we can substitute this equation okay these two equation and we should get delta equal to rho minus y theta minus rho theta and we can easily simplify it where it will become delta equal to negative y theta so the longitudinal strain epsilon x can also be calculated so we have the strain um, the strain for elements of jk uh, can be obtained by dividing the deformation delta over the original length l okay so we should get negative y theta from this equation and l is rho theta okay and we can get that epsilon x is equal to sorry epsilon x is equal to negative y rho so we have a minus sign uh, due to the fact that it is assumed that the bending uh, moment is positive and therefore the beam is concaving upward so now because the requirement that uh, the transverse section must remain plane uh, identical deformation must occur at all planes parallel to the plane of the symmetry okay and therefore the value of the strain given uh, at this equation epsilon x equal to negative y over rho uh, is also valid anywhere throughout the member and the longitudinal normal strain epsilon x okay we can see from this equation is the normal strain epsilon x uh, varies uh, linearly with the distance y from the neutral axis so if we have uh, if the distance y increase okay the normal uh, the normal strain epsilon x are also going to increase so the strain epsilon x are going to reach the maximum absolute value when y is the largest so where is the position where y is the largest we should have the location of y is the largest where y or the distance is at the upper surface of from the neutral uh, surface neutral surface or at the lower surface from the neutral surface so we can denote 
uh, that the largest uh, distance from the neutral surface as C uh, and this is going to correspond to both upper and lower surface and the maximum absolute value of the strain can be expressed as epsilon m is equal to C over rho okay, where C is going to be the uh, distance from the neutral surface okay either it is the upper or the lower and we can also uh, combine this equation the maximum absolute value of strain with the strain normal strain equation and we are going to get that epsilon x is equal to negative y over c epsilon m so in order to compute uh, the strain or stress at a given point of the member, we must first locate the neutral surface in the member. So this is going to be one uh, major step in uh, determining the uh, strain. So now we are going to consider a case okay, where uh, the normal stress is lower than the yield strength and it means that the stress in the member remain below the proportional limit and the elastic limit as well so there will be no permanent deformations and we can use the Hooke's law for uni-axial stress material to be homogeneous we are going to denote the modulus of elasticity by E so for a linearly elastic material, which fall under this case, we can easily give an equation of normal stress sigma x is equal to E times epsilon x. And if we recall from uh, the previous part, epsilon x is equal to a negative y over c. So we can write that epsilon uh, sorry sigma x is also equal to a negative negative y uh, c times sigma m so we have sigma m as the maximum absolute value of the stress where y is the distance from the neutral surface and c is the maximum distance from the neutral surface. So this result shows that uh, in an elastic range, the normal stress are going to vary linearly with the distance from the neutral surface. Okay, so if the distance y increase, Okay, the normal stress sigma x are going to increase. We can easily draw a cross section. So we can say that the maximum absolute stress are going to occur at the top or at the maximum distance C from the neutral surface it can be at the top or at the bottom at the bottom surface of the member next we are going to note that neither the location of the neutral surface nor the maximum value sigma m of the stress have yet to be determined so both can be found using the previous equations where we can substitute uh, sigma x so these are the previous equation from which we have the force at uh, x component where we have fx equal to 0 and is equal to sigma x dA we can replace sigma x with this equation that we have and we are going to get integration of negative y c sigma m da by da 
is equal to 0 from which we know that the integration of y dA must be equal to 0. This equation shows that uh, the first moment of the cross section about it neutral axis must be 0. Okay, the first moment. And therefore, for a member subjected to pure bending and as long as the stress uh, remain in the elastic range, uh, the neutral axis passes through the centroid of the section. Okay, because we have uh, the moment is equal, the first moment is equal to zero. So this equation proved that. We are going to recall uh, from which was developed uh, in the previous lecture, okay, where we have uh, the moment at uh, z axis, negative y, sigma x, dA is equal to moment m. And we are going to specify that the z axis uh, coincide with the neutral axis. Uh, and we are going to substitute sigma x uh, with the equation that we have previously. Therefore, we are going to get integration of negative y. Negative y over c. Sigma m. Da is equal to m or we can also write sigma m over c integration of y square da is equal to m so we are going to recall that for pure bending uh, the neutral axis pass through the centroid and I is going to be the moment of inertia or the, the second moment of area of the cross section. And it is going to be in respect to the centroidal axis uh, perpendicular to the plane of the couple M. So we can solve this equation where sigma M are going to be equal to M C over I. So, I is obtained from here. And if we substitute uh, maximum normal stress uh, sigma m with sigma x, we are going to get sigma x is equal to negative m y over i. Okay, where m is the moment y is the distance the neutral axis and i are going to be the second moment of area so these equations are called as the elastic flexure formula and the normal stress sigma x caused by the bending or the flexing of the member is also called as the flexural stress. The stress is compressive where sigma x is smaller than zero. When it is above the neutral axis, y larger than zero. When the bending moment m is positive. And when the bending moment m is negative, okay, the stress sigma x are going to be uh, larger than zero and under tensile. So now we know that the maximum normal stress due to bending is sigma m equal to mc over i. Okay, where i is the section moment of inertia and uh, c is the distance from uh, is the maximum distance from the neutral surface. Okay, we can represent okay, I over C as another variable S where S is I over C and this is also called as the section 
modulus and we can substitute the maximum normal stress C, uh, also going to be equal to m over s so this is an alternative form for the maximum normal stress so we have mc over i and also we have m over s where s is the elastic section modulus i over c so since the maximum stress sigma m is inversely proportional to the elastic section modulus s okay for engineers uh, the beams must be designed with as large as a value of s that possible that is practical for example a wooden beam with a rectangular cross section of width b and depth h will have a section modulus of uh, s equal to ic because it is rectangular so the second moment of area are going to be 1 over 12 b h cube divided by c okay the maximum distance should be half of the depth so it will be h over 2 and we are going to get the section modulus is equal to 1 over 6 a h so we know that from this equation the area this is going to be the cross sectional area and h is the depth or the height for two different beams that have the same cross sectional area as shown in this uh, figure here okay one with uh, depth 150 and another one with uh, depth uh, 200 millimeter 200 millimeter so although both have the same cross section area okay due to the larger value of depth h okay the beam at the right part here are going to have a larger section modulus so therefore this beam over here are going to be much more effective in resisting bending so in the case for a structural steel where we have a lot of applications in buildings and high rise tower for uh, American standard beams uh, S beam okay, this one, and the white flange beam W beam uh, preferred over to other shapes be sorry because a large portion of their cross section is located far from the neutral axis so we have the neutral axis so these shapes are going to have very large depth or very large value of h where we have a large portion is located at the end uh, or the top and bottom surface of the beam so therefore for a given cross-sectional area and a given depth uh, this design are going to provide large value of i and also large value of s section modulus so the values of uh, the elastic section modulus of uh, commonly manufactured beams can easily be obtained from tables uh, that list up various geometric properties of such beam so usually engineers are going to uh, read the value from the tables okay to determine the maximum stress sigma m for any shapes or any design of section that is uh, that's fall under standard beam so we are going to take a look uh, at one of the tables of properties of road steel shape so we have okay the designation the dimension base and depth of the steel shapes and we also have the area Okay, the depth D 
and basically we are going to use uh, the moment that is being applied at x this x x so it depends on uh, in which orientation did the ori uh, did the moment is being applied is it under at the axis xx or under axis yy so we have uh, the second moment of area okay the section modulus and also the same we have for axis y second moment of area and also the uh, section modulus Okay, so basically we are going, our engineers and designers are going to refer to these tables. Next, let's have some review on the second moment of area, uh, which is I, that we have been discussing previously. So, uh, for a rectangle, this is all common shape, rectangle, circle and triangle. So the second moment of area for a rectangle should be given by this equation. Okay, 1 over 12 times B H Q. Okay, where B is the base and H is the depth. For circle, the second moment of area are going to be given by pi D power of 4 over 64. So where D is the diameter. And for triangle, Okay, the second moment of area are going to be pH cube over 36. Let's go into the next topic, uh, which is the deformations in a transverse cross sections. So, the deformation of the member caused by bending moment M is also measured by the curvature of the neutral surface. Okay, so if we have uh, we have the neutral surface and the curvature is defined as the reciprocal of the radius of curvature rho. Okay, curvature rho. And it can be obtained by solving the equation for I over rho. So we have uh, from the previous part, we have what up 1 over rho is equal to epsilon m over c and we are going to assume that it is under elastic range where sigma sorry where epsilon m is equal to sigma m over e and we can substitute this equation into the uh, curvature rho equations and we should get sigma m over E C and sigma m is equal to m c over i. So we should get we should get one one e c times m c over i. And we can also write this as m e i. Although it is shown that the transverse cross section of uh, a member in pure bending remains plane, there is still possibility that deformations within the plane of the section occur. So recall from previous part that uh, elements in a state elements is in a state of uniaxial. So therefore, sigma x must not be equal to zero. But we know that sigma y is equal to sigma z is equal to zero. And all these deform in the transverse y and z direction as well as in the axial x direction. So the normal strain epsilon y and epsilon z will depend on the Poisson ratio nu for the material use. And we can express that the strain at y axis, epsilon y, is equal to a negative nu epsilon x. Similarly, for the strain at z axis, 
can be expressed with the relation with the Poisson ratio negative nu times epsilon x. And we can recall uh, from the previous part, we are going to have that epsilon y is equal to nu y over rho. Similarly, for epsilon z is nu y over rho. So this relationship show that uh, the elements located above the neutral surface uh, where y is larger than 0 are going to expand in both uh, y and z direction. So in y direction. This relationship show that the elements located above the neutral surface where y is Okay, y is uh, larger than 0 are going to expand in both y and z direction. Okay, while uh, the elements located below the neutral surface where y is okay, where y is less than 0 are going to contract. So as far as the deformations in the horizontal transverse uh, z directions are concerned, However, the expansion of the elements located above the neutral surface and the corresponding contraction of the elements located below that surface are going to result in various horizontal lines in the section being bent into the arcs of circle. We are going to have arcs of circle with a center C. And uh, this situation is actually similar to that in the longitudinal cross section. Okay, this is similar to one that we have been discussing previously. Okay, with the arc with the center C. So we can uh, represent uh, the we can represent the reciprocal of the radius of curvature rho prime and call it as the anticlastic curvature and the equation is given by 1 over rho prime equal to nu over rho so basically in this topic we have finished with uh, this uh, with the strain caused by bending the stress Okay, due to bending and we have uh, beam section properties sigma m equal to ms and we are going to have uh, one tutorial before we go to our next lecture that's it for this video thank you for watching and see you again